one thing anybody can do is take a look at what they do in their daily life and what makes them really happy and find a way to give back through that thing. Um, so for me, it's, it's volunteering at races. It's working with uh, tra the trail building community. It's uh, volunteering whenever I can through, through my community. So um, I, I have this passion and I have this love for this sport of running. And if, if I just keep it all to myself, I feel like that's, a, that's kind of a shame. And that's unfortunate. So, you know, my, my greatness, I, I look at it long term is, you know, kind of what is my legacy in running? And if I were to, so to have an unfortunate accident and die tomorrow, like, how would people remember me as, as a runner and as an athlete? Would they remember me as some, some asshole that just showed up the race and threw elbows and wanted to beat everybody? Or did they think of me as the guy that, you know, wanted to, to be the nicest guy at every race, wanted to shake every hand and then give back through the sport any way possible. So Hello and welcome to Activating Greatness. I'm Nathan Crane, an award-winning author, documentary filmmaker, and health and wellness expert. And I'm Derek Crane, a certified personal trainer, health and fitness coach, and trainer of professional athletes. Each week, we broadcast new episodes with experts on life, health, fitness, business, and leadership to help you manifest the greatness that's already within you. Activating Greatness is about helping you live your life to your fullest potential and live with more meaning, purpose, health, and fulfillment. In this episode, we're talking with Don Reichelt. Don is an ultra runner running multiple 100 plus mile distance races, including being on the US team at the 153 mile Spartathlon in Greece, and recently finishing what's considered the toughest foot race in the world, known as Badwater 135, in a remarkable podium finish of third place. Don's also an endurance coach and owns the company Boundless Endurance. His website is boundlessendurance.com and you can find him on Instagram at uh, Run With Don. He's also on Facebook. You can search him there. Hey, Don, welcome to the show, man. Awesome, Nathan. Great to be here. Excited to have a chat with you. Absolutely. So last time I saw you, um, I was filming you, did an interview with you for your Badwater uh Badwater experience and that's on YouTube as well. I encourage everyone to take a look at that. It's an awesome little uh, snippet into some of uh, the preparation and what Don was going through and kind of also the, the after effects of uh, Badwater 135. Um, but since then, what's happened, man? You've, uh, you've gotten injured. Yeah. Tell us about that. Yeah, I've had, a, I've had an up and down season with the, obviously the high being bad water and then uh, a couple of lingering injuries shortly after that and then most recently in a race in December uh, I broke my foot and my ankle and uh, I've had a little bit of a rough go uh, recently since then but you know that that race I, I, I knew I, I'd either broken something or ruptured something but I went ahead and, and finished the last uh, eight or nine miles uh, grabbed a podium spot at that race and then uh, head off to the to the ER to get some x-rays uh, to confirm the break so uh, the road since since then has been interesting um, we can get into a little bit more but man I've, I've learned a lot about life and running and appreciating what I had before and what I'm looking forward to but uh, you know, as, as of this conversation we're having right now, I officially got the okay yesterday to run again. So, um, I, I definitely am in, in high spirits. Nice, man. That's awesome to hear. Um, so going back a little bit, uh, I want, I want you to, you kind of just skimmed over that. Like, yeah, I broke my foot and then I finished the last eight or nine miles and podium. Hang on a second. So what, so what happened there? So what, what race was this? How far were you running and, and what sure. happened? Sure. So it's a race. It was a race here in Colorado. It was in Golden, Colorado, called the the Sawmill. Um, it's uh, two two distances: a seventeen mile race and a uh, a two lap seventeen, so a fifty five k ish race, um, thirty four or so miles. And I was technically doing the two laps, um, but unfortunately, I had my injury in the first lap. But they let you, if you finish one lap, you you're considered a finisher in that first lap. So. 
Um, I went ahead and pulled the plug after the first lap, and I happened to end up in the top, uh, I think, I think I ended up in second in that race, uh, which I wasn't even racing, but man, I was, I was cruising in that 55 K and I was, uh, uh, I was pretty out front having my little, my little, uh, accident. And, uh, yeah, as soon as I did it, I was just severe pain knowing that. What'd you do? Did you just, just roll your ankle and fall? Yeah, I was, I was, I was, I was coming downhill pretty hard and a corner and, uh, I, I stepped on a rock weird and my foot actually rolled like up over itself. Um, so I, I had an avulsion fracture of the cuboid, which basically is just, uh, um, the bone pulled off and then, uh, it also broke the head of the tailor. So the, the head of the tailor and, um, yeah, not, a, not a fun combination to have, but uh, it's, it's a trail race. So, you know, it, it might sound awesome that I, you know, had to persevere through finishing and wanted to, but realistically I was in the middle of the woods with nowhere to go. So, uh, my options were to walk a handful of miles to the next aid station or just keep running uh, through a little bit of pain and finish. So uh, being the hard-headed runner that I am, I decided just to keep running through the finish and uh, drop at the 17 and just so happened that I was up you know, in the podium position in that shorter race too. So what, uh, what do you think has been the biggest takeaway for you from this injury so far? Right. So, you know, first, first and foremost, I haven't really taken any time off of running in four years. Um, it's, it's been kind of my, my main activity. It's my out, it's my meditation. So this is the first time I've had a chance to not run, uh, forcefully in a long time. And it's, it just afforded me the opportunity to, uh, kind of pay attention to my life a little bit better and, and notice things that I hadn't been noticing and, ultimately remember why I loved running so much. Uh, you know, fast rewind back two months ago, I was, I was signing up for the next race. I was doing my next run just because I was like, Oh, I got to this level. I can't lose it. I have to keep going. I, I, uh, I need to, to keep moving and, and I can't stop. And, and it got to the point where my only motivation to keep running was success and results and Instagram. And it wasn't for me anymore. So forcing myself to stop, um, I, I've slowly over the past two months of not running remembered why I love the sport of running and why I participated. And it became more about, I want to get back to running for me, not because of podiums and Instagram and, and things like that. It's, it, it's purely back for the love of running and I missed it more and more. And the other aspect of that is, you know, I feel like, um, I, I became a better husband. I became a better partner on the house. I, I had, before we would eat dinner and then I'd be, oh, I can't help clean. I need to go run. Um, and it, it had become an excuse for me to get out of, out of responsibilities. And now, now I didn't have it. And I realized how important it was for me to start doing that stuff more. So uh, it's definitely you know, made me become a better husband and, and brought me closer to my wife uh, and also relit that fire for me to run again. It's awesome that you've become aware of those things like so quickly, you know, oftentimes people take injury after injury after injury and things get worse and worse and worse before like some of those, you know, life conscious awakening uh, awarenesses happen, right? It goes, wow, this, this injury is actually right. helping me become a better person. And then the key obviously is to continue those new habits and practices and things we learn during that experience after that experience as well right so yeah yeah absolutely to our lives as we get back into you know yep. the hard training and the the many many miles a week that you're putting. yeah it's it's going to be going forward about how i you know I've, I've definitely learned a lot over the past few months and it's about you know applying these new lessons to my life both personally and then taking what i've learned and and using it to become a better runner uh, because I've, on top of the, the personal things that I've learned and I think I've, I've developed on, I've, I've also started going to just a kick-ass physical therapist who's helped me highlight some, some physical weaknesses that I've been kind of running through and didn't even notice they were there. Um, perfect example, like my glutes are really not firing at all. Um, and so we're working a ton to help my glutes fire, which ultimately is going to make me a incredibly stronger runner if i'm basically i'm going to be running with a full deck instead of just uh, you know piecing together whatever muscles are working that day so uh, i got the personal aspect that i feel like i'm gonna carry off after this injury and then also i'm 
I have this platform now to become a much better runner that I'm, I'm actually pretty, it's, it's hard to believe I never would have said this a month ago, but I'm pretty incredibly grateful for the opportunity that I wouldn't have taken on my own that I was forced to take through this injury. Yeah, that's awesome, man. That, uh, that that's just how much you're already gaining from, from this experience, you know, going back to like, you were saying you just kept running for years and years without taking a lot of time off. I know, um, in a lot of professional sports, you'll have an on season and an off season, right? Mm-hmm. And like CrossFit, for example, which is something I do daily, and uh, you know my goals are to compete uh, in CrossFit in the next couple of years. And I know you know you kind of build up a season over the year, and then you've got you know the CrossFit Games are kind of like the Super Bowl championship, and then most athletes at that point, um, you know, are taking a couple weeks off, sometimes even a month off and not doing much, right. More just light recovery stuff because like, you know, you're putting so much time and mm-hmm. training into, uh, you know, pounding the body and the mind too, you know, that like that few weeks or that month at the end of the season is like one of the most rejuvenating things you can do. Right. But you know, in, in ultra running, it's a little bit more challenging, right? Cause you're like, you're signing up for races all throughout the year. You don't necessarily have an on season and an off season. So you have to find a way to find that balance. Are you, have you thought about that and how you're going to like implement these kind of, you know, take a couple of weeks off here and there throughout the year. So, you know, you don't have to get to this. Point. Yeah. It's almost a, a negative to take time off it seems like a lot in ultra running so you're always thinking about man if i'm if i'm not running i'm not getting faster if i'm not running i'm not getting more endurance so it, it's it's really hard to sit back and, and you know again two months ago i never would have really thought hard about taking two months off is probably going to long term make me a better runner um, and it's just learning the importance of that and now really understanding uh, how good it is for let your body truly recover. Because if you're going from a hundred mile race, you might take a couple of down weeks and then you jump right back into it. I mean, that's not off time. That's, that's kind of letting your body a little bit recover, but you know, hundred mile races takes months to, to fully get your body back to. And if you're jumping right back into hard, hard endurance training two weeks later, um, there's some lasting effects of that hundred mile race. So uh, yeah, I'm, you know, and I think that the long-term effect for this is that I, I will be more cognizant of the recovery phase. And um, I think the benefit of the athletes that I coach too is, is understanding the mindset of the endurance athlete is to jump back in. And, you know, my, my job as, as a coach is to, to, to think for them. And I, I, I now see how much more important it is personally so I can help them professionally as well. So I, I think it, it, it it's an important aspect for me to understand on, on multiple facets. So what do you, what are some of the top things you've been doing that you feel have been really helping you recover fast? Sure. So, um, you know, and I have to give all the thanks to, to a local physical therapist, Brian Briggs, um, up at, uh, and I'm, I'm just outside of Denver. So up in Boulder, there's a place called Revo physical therapy. Um, I, that dude knows his stuff. He primarily works with athletes and things like that. And, um, he's gotten me doing all this awesome stuff. We're doing something called uh, blood flow restriction, um, which I'm not, I, I don't know if many people are aware of what it is, but it's a, it's a technology that's actually taken from the military. And it started uh, with soldiers fighting for their limbs. And it's a, basically it's a, a blood pressure cuff type device that you restrict blood flow to a limb. And then you work out under body weight conditions and it replicates uh, the physiological effect of a max rep. Um, so you're getting the bulk and the gain of a max rep while putting almost no weight on your joints. And it's, it's pretty incredible. So we were using this uh, BFR as um, a way to catch the atrophy in my right leg back up to where my left leg currently was because it was down about a centimeter when we started working together. So um, the, that's kind of the, a lot of the focus we've been doing. We've been doing, you know, basic, uh, basic body weight exercises and plyo stuff and light spinning and walking on a treadmill now that I can get cleared to walk uh, with this uh, blood flow restriction cuff on there. And it's been, holy man, it's, it's pretty incredible how quickly that works. Does that, is that wrapping your foot 
with the, is it right on your foot or is it on your ankle? So actually it's, um, we're doing full leg. So we're putting it up in the upper, upper thigh. Um, and, and that is basically restricting the blood flow of the entire leg. And then we're doing a lot of, um, spots and lunges and, uh, glute work, clamshells and fire hydrants and things what like is that. With- how long, how long, how long of a, does a session look like with the, with the restriction on? So, uh, squats and lunges and things like that will do 75 reps and that's broken up into 30 reps with a minute off, uh, or excuse me. 30 reps with 30 seconds off and then 15 reps, 30 seconds off, 15 reps, 30 seconds off, 15 reps. And then you, you, you take the pressure off. So those, uh, those 30 second reps, the 30 second rest breaks in between the reps are with the, the cuff still on. Um, so you really don't lose that pressure during those 75 reps. And then you take a break and then you'll go to another activity like a, you know, another squat or a lunge or something like that. And then, uh, it's been, for me, it's been culminating in uh, 15 to 20 minutes of spinning or walking with that cuff pressurized the whole time. Um, but that's, it's, you know, basically the whole session that I've gone through, the workout that I've gone through is about 45 minutes to an hour of work. Nice. Yeah. So that, so, so for people listening at, at uh, um, the kind of like at home, do it yourself version of that uh, is voodoo floss called floss and tack it's like compression tack you can get voodoo floss like on amazon or rogue or anywhere it's very common for like elite athletes as a warm-up um because of exactly what you're saying is you restrict the blood flow you do the squats you do the movements and then you take you know the floss off uh which is basically just rubber the kind of do it yourself it's just stretchy rubber that you can tighten and um, and then boom, all that blood just flows right back in there, and it just nourishes it with nutrients and and activates the area. So it's something that it's a pre it's it's an amazing healing and recovery right. tool. And and obviously, if you go to physical therapists like you're doing, you know they have it pressurized at certain pressure and all that. It's good to get the guidance on it. Obviously, if you're recovering from a serious injury, but just as a, as a a warm up tool and even a recovery tool it's a really great thing and again you know for people listening it's called voodoo floss and uh, a lot of free youtube videos on that on how to do that yourself too yeah yeah i've i've been using when i cuz i travel a fair amount and i i'm not always able to go to physical therapy office so they yeah, that Ro- rogue makes a really great one that yep. um, According to according to the research of the internet is the best on the market. Not that I'm sponsored or trying to plug them, but it's just it's just I have one. It's it's worked incredibly well out on the fly for me. That's awesome, and uh, obviously, you know, just staying you know staying off of it a little bit, right? I mean, well, so so there's two there's two sides of that. I mean, one is as soon as you can get mobilizing an injury you want to immediately right right but at the same time you don't want to do things that are going to re-aggravate it so how are you how are you finding that balance of like not running and, and re-injuring yep. it versus like you know keeping it active and mobile so that right. it feels faster so yeah especially with the foot i mean it's like everything goes <laughs> right on the foot man it's like it's so hard to do stuff on the foot like luckily there's a lot of different stuff that i have been doing that isn't impact bearing. Um, I've picked up aqua jogging for the first time. So you take that float belt into the deep end of the pool and basically just sprint in place where you can't touch the bottom. And, and it kind of gets that full range of motion in your legs and it's giving you a little bit of resistance. And But again, no impact on the foot. And then, you know, after a month when I when the bone was healing and most of the pain had, had subsided, I, I started doing some spin work on the bike with this really light pressure. And then a couple weeks later doing a little bit of walking just around the house. Like, so I had a walking boot and I was in, out into the world and uneven surfaces. I had that on religiously, but uh, I got to the point my physical therapist felt confident that I could take that boot off uh, around the house and just kind of start putting, again, I'm not like running up and down stairs at this point, but yeah, just kind of moving the foot through the range of motion, putting some weight on it, not really putting a ton of impact, but just kind of working on getting it strengthened back. Because in my, in my situation, the most dangerous thing isn't necessarily re-injuring the bone that was broken, but it's 
jumping back onto a atrophied weakened foot and expecting it to perform like it used to and, and re-injuring some other aspect of the foot. So we've, we've been trying to, at the same time that we are cognizant of the break net recovering, we are trying to be cognizant of strengthening the foot back and making sure that, you know, when my orthopedic surgeon says, Hey, you're good to go for, for weight bearing impact activities that we weren't just going to jump right into a situation where the foot was going to be injured. So uh, yeah. it's been, it's definitely been a, a tiered process of, of you know, getting it moving and then starting to add the impact back and getting okay to walk more and more. And, um, and then just again, yesterday getting that, Hey, I can run now. Nice. Nice. Uh, are you still taking the, the recovery CBD from performance tea as well? Yes, absolutely. So that is uh, that is a nightly regimen, actually, for both me and my wife. We, uh, you know, before either of us goes to bed, the first one that gets up uh, to start getting ready for bed turns on the tea kettle and, and starts the tea for that. And it's just been a kind of a no-brainer part of my recovery. Nice, nice. So I want to talk a little bit um, about when you are training, you're building up to, let's say, a 100-mile race. What does that look like? What does your training schedule look like? How many miles a week are you putting in? What kind of cycle are you? Is it like a three or four month cycle? And are you building up over that time? Like, like walk us through what, what that normal training looks like. Sure. Yeah. So it's, it's a little bit different for every race based on the terrain and uh, you know, the, the physical aspects of the specific race because a hundred miles on mostly flat crush line zone is going to be dramatically of a different training than a hundred miles in Leadville up and down a mountain. Um, so it's, it's, it's taking the race and then almost working backwards, uh, taking a look at what are the physical demands of the race? What, what are, what's required of me to be competitive? Um, what's, uh, you know, the different factors are, are pretty important. So working backwards, understanding, you know, where my physical strengths are and weaknesses are, uh, you know, you, the old saying is you, you work on the, the least specific things uh, further away, uh, work on your, uh, your weaknesses further away, and then closer to the race, you can start working on the more specific uh, and then some of your strengths. So for me, it's, it's a good three-month block. Uh, and again, this is coming from a pretty good base in the past, so it'll be a little bit different now coming back from an injury. But if I'm, if I'm in pretty good shape, I've had a good winter, uh, a good three-month block will get me in what I would say competitive 100-mile shape. Um, that involves, uh, you know, coming off of what I would say a good base phase already. Um, I would never, in, in the stuff that I'm doing, the base is just the base. You know, you can't call the base part of your actual training block. It's just where you start. So um, coming off of a good base where I'm probably running 60 miles a week, uh, I'll start working into much more speed work, uh, much more hill work uh, based on the race and stretching out those long runs. So I usually like to go uh, two to three weeks of uh, build, and then depending on how that build has gone, that third or fourth week, I'll take a step back week that'll be a little bit of recovery, uh, lower the intensity, lower the long stuff, uh, just give my body a chance to kind of rebuild, and then we'll jump right back into two or three weeks of, of harder effort, um, and then kind of repeat that cycle as I build up. 100-mile um, race, Again, it's, it's a little bit different on, on big mountain stuff, uh, but I like to get in a, probably a, at least uh, one weekend that involves probably 55 to 65 miles uh, over two days, and that could involve a 50-mile you know, run on Saturday and a 10-mile you know, on Sunday or a 35. And, you know, just give me something of a really good weekend that involves Sunday with a really good run with some tired legs. Um, that's kind of the, the bulk, the big stuff that everybody talks about, that big run leading up. But then during the week I'll do uh, usually Tuesdays, Thursdays, a little bit harder. So a uh, repeats, mile repeats, maybe some tempo, a three mile hard, mile off, three mile hard, something like that. And then I'll also usually back those, uh, those hard days up with some body weight work. So, uh, you know, typical lunges, squats, uh, light, maybe throw 10 pound dumbbells, but nothing really big. I don't want to, I don't want to go for the bulk. I want to go for the endurance. So I'll do, 
um, kind of a 45 second on type thing, 15 second off, and then jump right into the next one and, and just do them until uh, the, the timer blows. Low, so I'll low, back that hard low, Tuesday. Low weight, low weight, high reps. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll run through that on usually Tuesdays and Thursdays. Uh, Wednesday is kind of a wild card day. Maybe I'll bike, maybe I'll do a, a, a slow midweek run. Um, and then, yeah, that's kind of the bulk of it. Those are, those are the three most important aspects. Uh, the Tuesday, Thursday, long, uh, harder stuff with some little bit of strength stuff. And then the weekends just kind of stretching myself out doing the longer stuff. So yeah, that sounds like a pretty, pretty similar to like, um, I've been following a, a weightlifting strength training program for about, I'm on month seven now. And basically we have like four, four week meso cycles where you build up in weight over three weeks. And then the fourth week is like a deload week, right? Yep. It's still moving, still active, all of that. But the weight is significantly decreased, let things rebuild. And then you start again, but in this case, you know, building for strength every month, the, the weight uh, actually increases. So mm -hmm. it sounds like similar, obviously, for, for what you're doing with uh, training for these big races. I want to talk a little bit about your mindset. Like, what are some of the, you know, I've, the, I've only ran one ultra marathon so far. Um, it was 35 miles. It was a 57K. Um, I only had six months of running experience before that which is not enough. I do not recommend that for anybody because <laughs> I could only build up to like 30 miles a week for the last few weeks. And that was challenging and you should be doing even for 35 mile, you should be doing like 50 miles a week, you know, 50, 60 miles a week, I would think. Right. Um, so I don't recommend that plan for anybody, but I went through a lot of my own, you know, mental stuff throughout it, the challenges, all that. And then, you know, with obviously when I, finished it, which my only goal was just to finish. Um, I mean, I felt like a different person at the end of that race. What are some yeah. of the, what are some of the kind of ups and downs and the, the, the mental emotional stuff you go through when you're going through these hundred mile races, which is sure. three times the length <laughs> distance and time of, of what I did at that 35 mile race. Right, right. So, you know, the, four, the most important aspect uh, for any ultra runner that does any distance is to remember that it's never as bad as you think it is at the worst moment. And it's probably never as good as you're feeling at the best moment. So it's somewhere in between because uh, in ultra running, you go through these highest of highs where you think you can run six minute miles and you know, logically you shouldn't most likely um, unless you're like Jim Walmsley or, you know, somebody that's stupid fast that, that can get away with that. But, um, and then it's never as bad when you're like, Oh, you know, everything's terrible. Like I can't keep food down. The world hates me. Like I don't want my crew yelled at me. Like it's, you go through these pits of just total despair that you don't even want to keep moving. So, you know, kind of reminding yourself that that's, sometimes is part of the game and you know I've, I've worked a lot at trying to get rid of that and I think you know not to totally transfer into some diet things but you know kind of switch into more of a, a low carb high fat diet has helped out a ton because I don't have those those crashes yeah, but uh, yeah it's just understanding the mind I think is the most important aspect of an ultra runner is that you know, your mind will play tricks on you and it's never exactly what it seems um, and then Probably one of my my tactics that I love and I'm successful with is is really segmenting the race. Uh, it's really really difficult, even for somebody like me who's done it a ton of times, just sitting there and thinking, "Oh, I have 75 miles left to go in this race." But if you if you allow yourself the opportunity just to say, "Hey, like I have three and a half miles to the next aid station." where I can get more food and get a new bottle of water. And then you get there and you're like, Oh, I have five and a half miles to the next aid station. And you allow yourself the opportunity to only think of the race in sections. It becomes a lot less daunting. And I hear this all the time from athletes and you know, people that I work with is that they focus so much on the big goal, that big number that they don't allow themselves the opportunity to, you know, think small. And, uh, it's, it's a pretty dangerous thought process because yeah, hundred miles, 75 miles, 60 miles, whatever is a daunting distance. But if you just allow yourself to break it down five miles at a time, it becomes a lot more easy to, to mentally process. 
So I do want to talk a little bit about your diet since you brought it up. You are, um, you said low carb, high fat. So what, what does that look like for you? Because you don't, you don't see that a lot in um, a lot of successful, uh, a lot of successful athletes, um, especially when you're really taxing mm-hmm. uh, your glycogen stores at a high level as, as an elite athlete, right? You're usually seeing primarily higher carbs um, because it just turns to right. energy faster, right? So, yeah, t- yeah, walk us through your diet and, and what you've learned from it. And yeah, how, yeah, how so... Fun. So I definitely, I'm not a, I'm not strict, low carb, high fat. Um, I kind of work that into my diet and phases to basically help my body process the fat so that when in an ultra race, like let's say I get sick and um, my stomach decides it can't take on carbs or anything like that. I have a fuel source that will keep me from those pitfalls. Um, so there is, there are a ton of athletes kind of in my realm that have shown the success of that. Um, the guy that, that I have learned from is Jeff Browning and he's you know, 47 years old and winning races all over the planet. And, right. uh, he, he, he is a strict low carb, high fat. Um, but he, he does it in periods and phases. And so, um, he'll do it and then he'll come back to more of a paleo diet. Um, and you know, working in more of the potatoes and things like that. And that's, that's how I've, I've learned to do it is, is you, you go through a pretty strict, you know, keto phase and then you work backwards a little bit and you, you, you go more to that paleo uh, with the fresh fresh fruits after hard workouts because you do need some carbs before and after workouts because right. you know you can't go out realistically and expect to, to throw down a really killer workout and come back and you know, just eat I don't know a, a burger with you know, a little, you know a little bit of lettuce on it and, and have your body be properly recovered. So, um, I found it best, uh, in working with him and experiencing things is, is yeah, put it in a phase of that keto type. Uh, and then once your body kind of starts responding to that work in, uh, strategic carbs around workouts and a lot around hard efforts and around races, um, about a little bit before a race, maybe 10, 15 days before a race, do a little bit of keto again, just to get that fat burning fuel, get that the body trained again to burn the fat. And then during the race, you're relying on uh, maybe 100 to 125 calories an hour that are carb based, like the goo and things like that. But you don't need, you know, I, I, I went from 250 something calories an hour to I was able to take in a little bit less uh, carb based fuels during the race. Um, because my body was a little bit more efficient at burning in multiple different fuels kind of uh, at the same time. So when you're, when you're training your body for a keto phase, how long do you usually do that for? Is it a month, a few weeks? I, I found about five weeks to be my optimum. Five, yeah. five weeks at a time and then you go back. You're, yep. you're doing paleo for what, another five weeks or how long? Yeah, just, just until um, usually about a couple of weeks before the race. And then, yeah, I'll, I'll throw in a couple of days of, of that keto just to, just to kind of, again, I, I don't expect to get, you know, full ketosis or anything like that in that phase. But I, right. I, I do, you know, it has shown that your body can kind of remember those fat burning properties again. And then closer to the race, closer to the race, you're working in a little bit more paleo, throwing in some strategic carbs and starches with the potatoes. And, uh, and then you put yourself in a situation on race day that your body knows how to burn fat and it knows how to burn carbs. And it's just a, it's a more efficient uh, you know, creature at that point because I can burn whatever is on hand. Yeah, and that's, you know, it, it obviously makes sense for endurance sports to be able to train your body how to burn fat. Uh, mm-hmm. It's just because it's it's a slower, longer burning fuel, right? Right. And, um, you don't have to, you know, it takes longer to process and digest, but it also, you know, burns longer than than carbs. Carbs are like boom, you could take in some fruit and immediately within fifteen to twenty minutes have energy from that fruit, right. whereas fat takes a lot longer. But in an endurance situation, like in a high intensity, short, explosive competition like CrossFit you know, keto doesn't work. Doesn't make sense. Uh, No, no, because you're, you know, you're doing a five minute workout, a 10 minute workout, 12 minute workout. It's like, you want to be as efficient and fast and explosive Mm -hmm. as possible. You need the carbs for that. Right. Whereas endurance, um, this is the first time I've, I've heard of, of, of this kind of, uh, training your body 
you know, to process keto, but then you're still doing carbs and then you're able to, to use both of them during a long endurance race. It makes so much sense and it's awesome to hear that yeah, you're, it's, you're having success with it. It's pretty powerful to, and I, and I kind of talked about this a little bit before, but you go through those like the pits and like the high of the highs and the low of the lows. And it's like, man, imagine like mile 40, you drink some Coca-Cola. Like that's, that's just rocket fuel, right? <laughs> right. Like you're going to be jacked up on sugar and carbs and caffeine and all this stuff. But then like, if that's your only fuel, like when that's, oh. when that's done, like you are, you're in a dark place. Toast. And so, so like kind of having some of this fat burning stuff that goes along with it is it kind of keeps the margins thin. You know, you're not going to, you're not going to rely on, pounding a Coke and a bunch of goo and having that like totally euphoric feeling, but you're also not going to have that just total pitfall when you run out of carbs and you know, you need something. So it kind of keeps you much more in the middle and yeah, which me as a competitor, I'm, I'm a much more predictable runner at that point And I know what I need to do. That's awesome, man. There's a lot of insight you, you shared there. So thanks for that. Um, and, uh, as we're kind of starting to wrap up a little bit here, um, boundless endurance. So, so you're a coach. Talk a little bit about what that looks like, what, what athletes you're coaching or what does your endurance coaching look like? Sure. So I, um, I work with, with runners primarily. Um, I've worked with everybody from 5K runners that have never gotten off the couch in their life that just want to get going um, to people looking to get a faster time on the next hundred miler. So um, I, I work with everybody. I love working with everybody where I have found my niche that I absolutely love, uh, mostly because it's bringing people into my world. It's taking people that have been uh, established as runners, but maybe at the half marathon or marathon distance, maybe they've done a triathlon or two, but they're thinking about their first ultra. They're, they're kind of thinking like, how do I get into this sport? What do I need to do? Because you know, I'll, I can talk to you all day about there's so much stuff and I'm sure you stumbled upon some things in your 35 mile or that like until you know it, you just don't know it about ultra. And that's yeah. one of the most fun things for me is talking about these athletes that, that, you know, they've, they've run a half marathon or two, but they want to do a 50 miler. And it's like, here's all the stuff that you need to learn. So for me, it's a lot more than just uh, you know, here's a workout, here's some things that I'll do to be physically prepared, but it's also talking to them about, like, here are the things you need to do to be mentally and, like, product-wise prepared, like, what do you need to have? Um, I mean, headlights and trekking poles and backpacks and, you know, when your crew needs to be where, like, all these logistical things of ultra running is, it's fascinating to me, and I love, like, just talking through an athlete to, like here is a plan to get you to the finish line of your first race. It's not just, you know, hard workouts on Tuesday, Thursday, long runs on Saturday. It's like, here are all the things that we need to do to make you physically and mentally prepared. And I, I think it's a fascinating way to be involved with the sport. And I, I love as much as I can, I'm at the finish line of my runner's races and like just that satisfaction from a coach's standpoint to say like, I, you know, I took this athlete that, 16 weeks ago they came to me and weren't sure if they could finish a you know a marathon even and now they did this 50k and they're euphoric and I'm euphoric and you know we hug and cry and whatever but it's just such a cool part of the sport that I can give back to people thinking of taking that next step and uh, man it gives me so much joy and it's, it's an amazing aspect of the sport for me to be involved with. Yeah it's awesome man I know that uh, when I finish the my uh, uh, let's call it future career in, in CrossFit years down the road I, I have a really strong feeling I'm gonna get back into ultra running and I mean I have like a lifelong goals of like doing a 50 miler a, a 100k a 100 miler so I will definitely be calling you that yeah man getting some coaching advice because I'll need it for sure it's a whole different world and I wish I would have uh, talked to you before I ever planned to run. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, that's just kind of how I do things. I was like, uh, rather than sign up for a half marathon or a marathon, which I'd never run before, I said, yeah. I'm going to do an ultra marathon. And, uh, and so that was the first race I ever ran in my life. And, and like I, I love said, it. I don't recommend anybody else do that, but, but I learned a hell of a lot from it. <laughs> oh, man, I love it. Yeah. And, and, and having a coach, I know, in any sport is uh, – 
exactly what you need for, for success. Right. And the, the advantage of a coach is, you know, one that's, you know, we have the knowledge of we've been there, we've done it. It's, we know what it takes to be successful and more importantly, like what you shouldn't do to fail. Uh, I think that's a lot of the aspect of coaching is like, here are all the mistakes that I've made here, are all the mistakes that I've seen other people make, like, let's not do that. And then, you know, for me, like I, I have a coach, right? I, I work with Jeff Browning and because he doesn't have a really a stake in the game. Like, so when he sees me start to underperform, he'll have that conversation like, Hey, like, I think it's time to take a step back. Whereas me as a competitor as athletes, it's go, 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 go. If I'm not running, I'm not getting better. And so it's, it's, it's this impartial third party that I'm basically, I've given my trust to him to control, uh, you know, what I'm doing because I know that he has my best interest in mind. And whereas, you know, it's hard for me to say like, I, I, I you know, even now coming back from an injury, I just want to go out and run, but I'm, I have this physical therapist, I have a coach that's saying, look, like, you know, running 20 miles today while maybe you think you can do it and your bone can probably do it. Like your, the rest of your body is going to break down. Um, so we have to do it smart. And that's, you know, I, I, I think all the money that I've spent on a coach in my life has been some of the, the, the best money I've, I've spent knowing that I've, I've learned a lot and I've done it the right way for the most part. Awesome. So we've got Don's uh, links in the show notes below. Check those out. Don's website is boundlessendurance.com. You can hire him as a coach. He also produces uh, running events as well. You can hire him for that. And you can find him on Instagram at run with Don. Um, Don, final question. Uh, we ask every guest this on the show. The show is called Activating Greatness. What is one thing you would suggest people do to activate their own greatness from within? So I, I think the one thing anybody can do is take a look at what they do in their daily life and what makes them really happy and find a way to give back through that thing. Um, so for me, it's, it's volunteering at races. It's working with uh, tra the trail building community. It's uh, volunteering whenever I can through, through my community. So um, I, I have this passion and I have this love for this sport of running. And if, if I just keep it all to myself, I feel like that's a, that's kind of a shame and that's unfortunate. So, you know, my, my greatness, I, I look at it long-term is, you know, kind of what is my legacy in running? And if I were to, so to have an unfortunate accident and die tomorrow, like how would people remember me as, as a runner and as an athlete? Would they remember me as some, some asshole that just showed up at the race and threw elbows and wanted to beat everybody? Or did they think of me as the guy that, you know, wanted to, to be the nicest guy at every race, wanted to shake every hand and then give back through the sport any way possible. So um, that's kind of how I think about activating greatness in myself. And I would uh, kind of extend, extend that challenge to all of your listeners to, you know, think about the thing that you love doing the most every day, uh, what, why it makes you happy and find a way to uh, share the happiness with other people. I love it, man. That is some awesome advice right there. And uh, obviously through giving back and supporting your community, you know, it makes you happier in life. It makes you more fulfilled and, 100%. And you get to help other people. And as you said, leave a positive legacy. So, Don, hey, thanks, brother. I'm, I'm glad to hear you're healing well. I look forward to uh, hearing about some of your upcoming uh, races and adventures and different things you're doing in the future. And uh, appreciate you being on the show, man. Awesome, brother. I really appreciate it, too. Can't wait till we talk again. Awesome. All right. We'll talk soon. Take care. That's it for today's episode. Our hope and desire is that you get as much out of these interviews and episodes as we do. Each week, you can count on us being here to help you activate the greatness that's already within you. And we can all do that by continuing to develop and grow our minds, bodies, emotions, and connection to a higher purpose. Please make sure to share this with your friends on Facebook, iTunes, Twitter, and Instagram. Tag Crane Factor and use the hashtag activating greatness so we can continue growing this community together and changing the world for the better. Remember, you already have greatness within you. You just need to activate it. Thanks again, and we'll talk to you on the next episode.